today we're going to consider uh, the great psalm or, or song or hymn of Mary uh, after God has told her that she is blessed, that she will be the one who carries uh, the Messiah. And you remember Mary's great confidence and faith. She says, you said it now, Lord, you do it. And that trust is played out as she visits her cousin Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, as she is confronted with Mary, remember John, uh, who Elizabeth is carrying, jumps in her womb. Uh, and Elizabeth, becoming filled with the Holy Spirit, says, blessed are you uh, amongst women. And Mary responds with this incredible uh, this incredible confession of faith. And what I want us to see in Mary's story is uh, the mouth of worship. Then next week, we're going to consider the shepherds and the visitation of the shepherds. And, and their, their story is interesting because, once again, the good news of the gospel is declared to them, and the angelic hosts sing, uh, glory in the heavens, God, Emmanuel, has come, and what do the shepherds do? They say, let us go and see this thing. And they go immediately to where the Messiah is, and there they worship him and share with Mary and Joseph what has happened. And there we see the feet of worship, what it means to pursue God in our worship. And then the third week, we'll consider the wise men. And the wise men are interesting because they come um, from the east following their readings of the stars and it leads them to the Messiah. And with them, what do they come? They come bringing gifts and we see the hands of worship uh, and, and the, how generosity is a component of worship. And the whole reason that I'm wanting to do this is as we closed our series last week, uh, we closed with the word worship and we saw that worship begins in submission that's initiated by the spirit that is defined by truth and expressed in love. But I realized that one of the needs for this church, I think, is for us to have a more robust understanding of what it means to be a worshiping community. And that what stunts our ability to worship in spirit and truth is our uh, tendency to truncate the meaning of worship, to reduce it to merely songs sung before a service. And what I want us to see is that the whole person is engaged in worship. So before I go any further, why don't we read uh, these verses together? If you can turn with me to Luke chapter 1, and we're going to... We're going to look here uh, at verses 46 through 56, and we're going to see Mary's response to the good news that has been declared to her. And the series is called Overwhelmed because the response always seems to be the same, is that the proclamation that comes to these people, they're first filled, they're overwhelmed by, with fear, and that overwhelm, uh, being overwhelmed with fear is replaced with an overwhelming desire to worship, uh, to to give themselves through proclamation, uh, through, through obedience, through generosity. Their whole person is involved in this overwhelming response to the gospel. Uh, and I think that Christmas, the holidays tend to be, in our society, overwhelming in the negative sense of the word. We're overwhelmed by the financial uh, hit that comes with needing to buy gifts for our kids, and we're overwhelmed by the rat race that our culture presents with us and the consumerism. And what I want us to be is overwhelmed by the gospel. Uh, when my heart is overwhelmed, says David, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. And it's not a matter of not being overwhelmed, it's just being overwhelmed with the right thing. Uh, and uh, I think it's an appropriate word uh, to describe these narratives. So beginning in verse 46, it says, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy 
as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Let's pray. And Jesus, I do pray that right now that by your Holy Spirit, you would teach us what it means to be a worshiping community. And that worship includes our confession of faith, our proclamation. And Lord, I pray that you would show us the ways that our words, what we communicate, uh, has the ability to reflect true and sincere worship, worship that is done in spirit and in truth. And that the ways that worship is played out, the heart, the worshiping heart reflects its worship is through what we say, through where we go, and through what we do. And so, Lord, I pray that this series would uh, inspire us to examine ourselves in the light of your good news, and that as we see how gracious you are toward us, your willingness to enter into our broken dilemma, the dilemma of existence in sinful bodies, but that you, O oh God, you who knew no sin became sin, that we might become righteousness. And Lord, I pray that we would see that you, Jesus, our judge, who is judged in our place, has made a way for us to be put right in communion with you, and that our worship of you is the outcome of our understanding of your gospel. May we see in this beautiful prayer from Mary the facets of worshipful proclamation. And Lord, we need you. We pray that by your spirit you would speak for your servants are listening. Amen. Well, let me begin before going any further into the prayer of Mary as reminding you that worship itself is whatever it is that has captivated our hearts. As James Smith said, in short, if you are what you love and love is a habit, then discipleship is the rehabituation of your loves. This means discipleship is more a matter of reformation than acquiring information. And James Smith in his book, You Are What You Love, describes discipleship and worship are, are two things that work together, that, that God has made us not simply thinking things. We're not brains on sticks, but the whole person, uh, the reflection of who we are and what is important to us and what we give our lives to is the true reflection of what we worship. What is it that you spend the most of your time talking about? Where do you spend most of your time going to? And how do you spend uh, the resources, the giftings that you've been given? How do you utilize those things? And whatever it is that you give yourself to uh, more, the most fully, that is what your heart is placed as ultimate, as supreme. And you can see very quickly that what we worship, uh, that... that False worship can be connected very quickly to things that are good things, but just put in the wrong place. And what I want us to see is that worship is more than the songs sung before a service, but that, that worship is, is something that is communicated. Uh, it, is, it is movement. It's actually taking us somewhere. And that it is ultimately um, our participation in God's kingdom purposes. Uh, literally, how we utilize our whole personhood, our bodies, our minds, our words, uh, to bring about glory uh, to our King who has given us so much. And so today we're going to focus on worship as proclamation, the confession of our faith, and that worship, when it comes to words, should not surprise us, being the fact that God has disclosed himself to us through this thing we call the scriptures, a big giant book. Like God cares about words as we just considered language of faith for the last three months, looking at all, the, all these words that, that create um, our understanding of what it means to be followers of Jesus, that Jesus himself is the logos, the living word. And that worship, being a worshiping community, means that our words will confess the reality of our relationship with the living Christ. And that is accomplished not simply through singing, although that is a facet and an important facet. In fact, the church uh, historically is unique in world religions is that we are truly a singing faith, that we confess our affection, our devotion to our King, Jesus, through song. That is one way that we worship. 
That's one way that we fulfill the call to be a confessing church. But another way that we fulfill our worship as a confessing church is when the church together is unified under the teaching or the proclamation or the preaching of the scriptures themselves. What we are doing right now is an act of worship, is that we come ready to hear from God, attuning our hearts and our minds together in a unified fashion to be spirit-filled and spirit-led into the ways of God as he has disclosed himself to us through the scriptures. We worship God in our, in our evangelism, in the proclamation of the gospel to the world beyond the walls of this church, to those who God is seeking to save the lost. That is an act of worship. We worship God in our prayers. For prayer is the proclamation. What we have before us is both a song and a prayer at the same time. Mary is singing out her communion with her God. She is singing to one whom she believes is there. And prayer in its most simple, uh, most root understanding of what prayer is, is talking with a God who's present, who's available, who is looking for people to seek him, to ask, to knock, and to trust that he answers. Our prayer is worship, but even our fellowship Speaking to one another, Paul says in Ephesians, in Psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs. Being spirit-filled, knowing together in a unified fashion what the will of God is. All of these facets of our communication, our confession, our proclamation as Christians are facets of worship that is to be done in spirit and in truth. And so what I want us to see in these verses is kind of the content of our confession, because I think that we can actually look at Mary's prayer and see what our worship when it comes to profession of faith should actually look like. And it begins in verse 46 and 47 when she says, Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. The first thing I want you to note about worship as a act of of proclamation or confession is that we conf- that we are grace oriented our worship through proclamation is that it must be grace oriented and grace orientation is what can is what establishes communion so What does Mary say here? My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. What is Mary doing? When I say grace orientation, it means that the central motivating factor in our our ethos as a church community is the good news of the gospel. Mary is responding to what has been declared to her uh, by Gabriel in regards to the fact that the Messiah, salvation is going to come through the birth of her son. And she doesn't even understand the depths of what that even means, but she trusts that God is fulfilling his redemptive purposes and plans for Israel and that he is utilizing her, whom she sees herself as she is, which is essentially an insignificant young girl in Israel. God has chosen this humble young woman to be the very one who carries the Messiah. And she doesn't even understand all of its ramifications, but she believes God, and like Abraham, it is accounted to her as righteousness. And what happens is that Mary's confrontation with this great declaration over her life, the good news of the gospel, even though she doesn't even have the robust understanding of the gospel that we have now, her response is one of praise. My soul magnifies the Lord. Our confession of faith, for it to be a worship that is done in spirit and truth, must be grace-oriented. That is that God is the central component of everything that we do, and not some nameless God, but God who has given us a name by which no other name under heaven can, uh, can a person be saved, and that name is Jesus. And so our confession as a church must begin with our, our exalting of King Jesus in everything we do. That grace orientation that is that our lives as a community of faith is built around the person of Jesus is the very thing that establishes us as a church that truly worships in spirit and in truth. 
And what's so powerful about this is that Mary is actually looking back. Uh, she's actually drawing from her own understanding of the scriptures, for there is a lot of similarity in verses 46 and 47 to Psalm 34, verse 2, uh, when the psalmist says, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. That helps you understand the meaning of my soul magnifies the Lord. Because what she is saying is that what is most important in my life is not my own personal identity and my own personal agenda, which is what most of us elevate or exalt in our modern context. But no, through her taking on the posture of what we see in, in uh, John the Baptist, I must decrease that he might increase. We see the true heart of worship, and that is the exaltation of a God who has pursued me, who has made himself known to me, who has given himself for me. All that can do is bring me to a place of, Lord, you alone deserve all my praise. Psalm 34, to you, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. And the question for us, church, is that are we truly a worshiping church? For it is defined by, the, by whether or not our primary, our primary confidence the thing that we are most excited about, the thing that we want to talk about more than anything else is not a thing at all, but a person, a person who has met us in our lowest point, our sin, and made it his own. It's when we want to talk about Jesus. A church that truly worships is a church that talks about Jesus. And that's what grace orientation is all about. Because we talk about what we love, guys. It's a fact. I always love to quote from my favorite Christmas movie of all time, which is Elf. Uh, I do think it's the, the greatest Christmas movie. Uh, it's, it's replaced Christmas story for me by far. Uh, and, and my favorite line is, is Will Ferrell's uh, breaking into his father's office after, uh, after he has fallen in love. He's, he's had his first kiss. And what does he say? I'm, he goes, I'm in love and I don't care who knows. And, and he's, you know, he's, in his, he's just like so overwhelmed with this, this experience because the, and, and what I think is profound about that is that actually is truth. It's an exaggerated reality that isn't that, what makes it so charming is it's not that exaggerated because all of us know what it was like to fall deeply in love. When I first met Darcy and fell in love with her, I, I couldn't stop talking about her. Everybody, people, and I like to talk. So when you have the gift of monologue, uh, like, and you fall in love, you're an unbearable presence in most people's lives. And I can tell you that that same reality around, around my faith in Jesus, I was an unbearable presence for most of my non-believing friends when I first came to faith because I fell in love with Jesus and I didn't care who knew. We know we're worshiping when we no longer care about the opinions of people because Jesus is so good. How could I possibly be silent about him? And I know that's deeply convicting because that's not the reality for most people. But the gospel should come that true to us, where we truly see it as the source for life and meaning and purpose. When we can come to that place like Augustine and cry out, Lord, my soul was restless till it found rest in thee. That's grace orientation. That's what Mary is saying. My soul magnifies a God and I am magnifying him because he met me. He pursued me. He met me in my low point. And what can I do other than recognize his goodness? For it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's powerful. Our proclamation of him as the central truth of who we are, whether it be in the teaching of the word, whether it be in prayer, whether it be in fellowship, uh, whether it be in song, we need to understand this. Psalm 22, yet you are holy, O Lord, dwelling in the praises of your people. God inhabits the praises of his people. And what that means is that praise is an acknowledgement of a God who is good, and is, and is met with us and will not leave us nor forsake us. Our worship as a confessing church must be grace-oriented. And when we confess the truth of who Jesus is, what we do is we establish communion. Because grace orientation is essentially the reestablishment of right relationship. 
not only with God, but it's played out in all directions that relationship is involved in our relationship with others and our, in ultimately even in our relationship with ourselves. Which brings me to the next section, 48 through 50. She goes on to say, for he has looked at the humble estate of his servant. Notice here that humility in Mary, but that humility actually is not self-deprecation, but it is followed by a strong confidence that is based not in what she has done, but in what God has done for her. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. So profound. That's a, one of the greatest passages on a right understanding of, of, of the biblical term humility, is that, that she has been humbled by God's goodness toward her, uh, in, that, in, that, in that humility, she is able to actually say, I am blessed, not because of who I am or what I have done, but because of what God has done for me. A, a, an absolute acceptance of God's new declaration over her life. That, and this should be something that's a part of our Christian life because it, it feeds into a right confession as a church that yes, we are sinners that have been saved by grace, but we are saints I think we're afraid to accept the title of saints because our sainthood is not based upon our performance, but based upon the performance of King Jesus. And that should humble us. And that should humble us. And she goes on to say, for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. So what you see here is if a worshiping community begins with a, uh, begins with a grace orientation that is a, an orientation around the central person of Jesus, that the, the second facet of a worshiping community um, in its confession is that our confession is marked by, by being humbly thankful. We have been humbled by God's willingness to utilize us in spite of our brokenness. And the only proper response to that Reality, God loves me in spite of who I am, is that I be thankful. And one of the great evidences that we as a church are not worshiping in spirit and in truth, actually one of the great tangible litmus tests for whether you're okay with Jesus is the level of gratitude in your life. Because our life circumstances can be so extreme that we can forget that God is still good and on his throne. And keep in mind the context of this prayer. Mary is a Jewish, a young Jewish woman who is like the rest of Israel living under the tyranny and the oppressiveness of Rome. And who had not, and in Israel who had not had a prophet amongst them for almost 300 years. God essentially for many Jews seem to have been silent or walked away from them or rejected them. And yet Mary reflects a heart of faith, believing in what she does not see but knows to be true. And that, that humble presence before a God who for many Jews seem to be absent brought about in her spirit instead of, instead of look at the world around me based upon everything that's happening around me, how could I possibly be thankful? And honestly, we think Mary's blessed could you imagine the, the, the scandal of her pregnancy, the challenges that she faced? Even she was told, given a prophetic word, that this boy, this Messiah, would pierce her side. It would be like a sword through her heart. That Mary would, what a gift, what a blessing. Someday you get to watch your son be crucified. How could we... How could we hold on to gratitude and thankfulness? It's that she, our gratitude and our thankfulness, we can take it from Mary's own words, is, is when we derive the meaning of our existence from, from our strong belief in God's ability to fulfill his purposes and his plans, regardless of what our world says, regardless of what we see around us, we never lose sight that God has not lost control. And Mary reflects that humble thankfulness is that she recognizes that he is God and she is not. And he has the sovereign freedom to do what he wants in accordance with his purposes and his plans. And if he wants to utilize this girl to bring about the Messiah, she says, Lord, you said it, so you do it. 
That's not a bold, brazen statement. That's a calm confidence that comes from a humble heart. And the only response that comes out of that is thankfulness. I think it's powerful when you read Paul's words so many times that, that we're told as a church that our confession is to constantly include thanksgiving. We're told to enter his gates with thanksgiving. It seems to be a beginning mark to all true worship. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you able to give God thanks for everything? What Mary is doing is giving us a picture of what a confessing church looks like, what true worship looks like for a confessing church, and that is our strong belief that God can take the ugliest, most dissonant note in human history and weave it into his beautiful song of redemption that he can override it all without ever being responsible for evil, but he can overcome it, and he will. And our belief that God is with us and for us, that grace orientation should be reflected in everything we say, everything we sing, everything we pray, and it should be marked by a humble thankfulness, a gratitude that God has not left us nor forsaken us, whether the world looks at us with skeptical eyes and says, where is the promise of your king's return? We trust in Jesus because our lives have been changed by his presence. And that should be proclaimed boldly and without apology, but always with thankfulness. What's fascinating is that humble thankfulness is what brings about a reflection of our devotion to Jesus. And people want to know what we're devoted to. And people want to see an establishment of our communion. And that comes from Jesus at the center. And the humility that comes out of putting Jesus at the center is not something that we can, that we can actually create. It's something that is the outcome of being confronted with the living Christ. Um, I love this because she goes on to say in verses 51 through 53, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Now what's fascinating here is that Mary seems to be declaring from her own understanding of her, of her, of her Jewish heritage um, and she is holding on to the promises of Scripture and the proclamations of the word that God is still in control of human history, even though that is not her reality. And I would say a third mark of a, confession, a confessing community when our worship is through our proclamation is done in spirit and in truth is that it's prophetically discerning. Because what Mary is experiencing as a citizen of Israel who is pushed out and not even allowed Roman citizenship and are treated like second-rate citizens, that God is still able to show strength with his arm, to scatter the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. She believes that God ultimately will be victorious, and she is clinging by faith to that reality, and it brings out a confession that is marked by what I call prophetic discernment. And I think what the church needs right now is that when our worship as a community is true, the confession of our faith will have a prophetic element. And what I mean by that is not the foretelling of the future, but what I mean is the ability to put our finger on the pulse of what God is up to. And that there is, a, there is a strong understanding. God is doing this thing. And I think that D Door of Hope actually in its early days had a stronger prophetic discernment than it has had in, in recent days. And I think all churches go through growing pains and awkward stages. And what happens is churches get bigger. It's easier to lose sight. There's more at stake. And it's easy to lose sight of that sort of reckless abandon that marks I think a healthy church plant, there kind of needs to be reckless abandon to actually even have the gumption to be a part of a church plant or a, a, a startup church. And I think that that prophetic discernment was a, was a constant seeking of, God, what are you up to in this place and how can we be a part of it? And I think that we can lose sight of what God is up to in our attempts to protect what we're comfortable with I think our worship begins to wane when we begin to lose sight of the fact that God actually is moving in a city like Portland, which sometimes you wonder if he is, but you're sitting here, which says that he is, because we're not the only church in town. And I think that this is the challenging thing, is that how quickly 
uh, prophetic discernment, which is an awareness of what God is up to and a decision as a community of faith to move toward that thing, uh, is that sometimes God gives us discernment into who he is and what he's up to without actually, whoa, what is that? It can't be my beard. All right. Is that better? Okay. Uh, I think that one of the things that happens is that we can be discerning, but it's not prophetic discernment. We're not, we're, we're paying attention. We can sense that something is wrong, but instead of actually seeking God's face in humility, that discernment all of a sudden becomes a critical spirit that begins to be troubled by, I don't like the changes we've gone through. I don't like the, I, I liked our Northeast building. I like the annex. I don't like Revolution Hall. I don't like the lighting here. I, I'm struggling with the worship. Because something feels wrong. And that can be a prophetic discernment, but it's misguided because it's not unified as a community of, Lord, it seems like we know what you want to accomplish, but we don't know how to do it. We've taken a misstep. Let's humble ourselves and figure out what it, what it is that we're supposed to do. I'm not saying that we've taken a misstep, but I'm saying when we do take missteps, which happens naturally because we are the children of God and any good parent gives their kids room to fail. We don't hyper control our, our children that turns them into, turns them into weirdos. Uh, and some of you may have that, weirdos, for children. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I think what we have to do is we give them enough space that we, we create parameters by which we want to give them room to, to breathe and to be able to mature, but they have to have some freedom. And I think we as a church, we can discern what God is calling us to, but he doesn't necessarily spell out every single step. And part of the challenge of growth as a community is to have the, the ability to come together as a community and say, okay, we feel like God's moving in this place. We tried to do it this way. And that didn't quite work out. So let's, as a worshiping community, as a confessing, com confessing community, we come back to our king and say, Lord, help us utilize even this step that we took that maybe feels wrong to bring about even greater glory for your purposes and plans in our, in our church. And I think that a true worshiping community is not afraid to take risks because they believe that Jesus is with them. And I think as long as we keep Jesus as the central facet of our hearts and the primary ambition of everything that we do, and it's not driven by self-centeredness, it's not driven by, by some sort of secondary issue, but no, we just wanna see the gospel go forth. We believe if Jesus be lifted up, he's gonna draw people to himself, that the nuances of how it is that we ought to do church, the outcome of a worshiping community is that we can actually move forward with, with courageousness in spite of what seem like difficulties or challenges, that these things can't rob us, like Mary in her praise, they can't rob us of our worship because there is a prophetic discernment that God is still ultimately in control and all I care about is knowing what his will is. Listen to this passage from Paul in Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 19. I think he captures this spirit really well. He says, look carefully then how you walk. Notice he's not talking to a person, he's talking to a church. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That's his cry to the church. You, a worshiping church, it's assuming, he's assuming that it's a worshiping community. Worship is assumed. It's the natural outcome of a right understanding of the gospel. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And here it is, addressing one another, proclamation, in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And I think that this is a profound uh, component, is that we together, we proclaim the goodness of God in song, in word, in preaching, in fellowship, in, in all of these arenas where we are communicating the gospel, that, that when we do this together, there comes that prophetic discernment that, that unifies us and creates the unity that is so desperately needed in the church and the very thing that the world is looking for and it's in, in real tangible evidence that what we have is something that they need. Does the world see that in our church? When a stranger comes in, are they experiencing a unity uh, and, and, an, and an excitement and an anticipation that we're gonna hear from God today? And we're going to confess the reality that he is with us. 
I love, finally, she says, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. She closes this psalm with a strong understanding of her own history, of her own scriptures, and shows us that true confession in worship is not only grace-oriented, it's not simply humbly thankful, it's not simply prophetically discerning, but it is also and must always be biblically anchored. It is anchored not in our understanding of the culture, but it is, our, it is anchored in, in our belief in the authority of the Scriptures in spite of our culture. But the challenges that we face today, and one of the things that I think hinders our worship as a church more than anything else, is our refusal to believe God at his word. But if we cannot trust the scriptures, why would we trust Jesus? For everything that we know to be true about Jesus has been given to us through the scriptures. I do not believe the scriptures are the third person in the Trinity, but they are the path or the, or the guide or the map that points us to the reality of who the living Christ is. And if we choose to believe Jesus is the savior of the world, but we don't like his ethic, which is, I think, what we deal with in this licentious period in which we live, especially in a city like Portland, where we want to merge our faith in Jesus with our, with our liberal leanings toward other things, social agendas, different issues that actually create embarrassment for us in our culture in which we live, what we do is we destroy our worship. We actually hurt our confession because a confession that is not founded on something solid is nothing. The whole reason people came to this church when it started is that there was a, there was a calm confidence, not in not in anything that I, I had in my own past. My only confidence was in what Christ had accomplished in and through my life as I trusted his word in spite of what my culture told me. And people want truth. They're hurting for truth. Everything is so, I just do what you feel, but what we feel cannot be trusted. And what's so powerful about the conf- confession of worship is that emotions actually play a massive part in true worship, but emotions must be anchored in sitting upon the foundation of truth, which is Jesus himself. And we can't trust our emotions unless they're built upon the foundation of Jesus. I want you to be overwhelmed with the person of Christ, not overwhelmed with the lies of this world. And I think that this is one of the the fascinating realities is she closes with, you have helped your servant Israel. There was nothing in her present experience that could even state that unless the Spirit revealed that the very promise that was given to her is God's ability to be good on his promises. And I think that this is important for us because 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And we can't move into true worship living according to what I call the false principle of selective sanctification, which is I pick and choose what works for me to ease the nagging voice of conscience. But when it comes to true surrender, where it says all that I am, all that I have, it belongs to you and is to be defined by you, King Jesus. It isn't until we do that that we will become a confessing church, a true church that worships. And I want that for us. You guys, when we are anchored in the truth of what Scripture is, and, and what scripture reveals, which it is God's self-disclosure of his heart toward us, his incredible love for us. It is then that we can confess for the purpose of releasing emotion, an emotion that's based upon the foundation of who Jesus is. God wants you to feel deeply. Why do we sing as a church? Why do we sing? Singing is one of the most powerful and emotionally manipulative um, mediums there is. Have you ever figured out the difference between poetry and, and, and song is actually pretty vast. And I've, I've dabbled in poetry, and I, I've figured out why I preferred 
uh, songwriting over poetry because poetry is the actually uh, is the much more difficult form because you're trying to create the emotional impact with only words as your tool, where song, you can hide really bad words with a good melody. <laughs> and I think that, that what we need in our, in our worship is a, a anchored worship in the truth of God's self-disclosure, which then gives us the ability to emote powerfully in truth, in spirit and in truth. And I think that this is why uh, the Reformed uh, camp today is very leery of any, any kind of usage of modern worship because they think, I don't know if they just think that like all divine illumination happened between the 15th and 17th century. Uh, but there is something what they're right about in regards to the hymns is that the hymn writers were theologians first and musicians second. They cared most about reflecting the truth of who God is as he has disclosed himself to us through his scriptures. And then they took that truth and they put it to song because, they, because song is one of the best ways to express that truth most fully and robustly where the whole person is involved. And when you come to church, are you coming ready to be engaged? Whether you're listening right now, are you listening with an intent to receive from the spirit? When you when the, songs are, when the songs are sung, are you lifting up your voice, whether you can sing or not, because your heart is overwhelmed with God's presence, with the love that Jesus has shown you through his sacrifice on your behalf? Are you filled with gratitude, thankful, humbled by God's goodness? Are you discerning that God is amongst us and moving and that there is a, there's a prophetic reality. God has a plan for us and a purpose, and we want to attune ourselves to that. These are the elements of what it means to be a worshiping church in our confession. And this is what God wants for us as a church. And my prayer for us today is that we would worship him in spirit and in truth, and that what we say would align with who we are in Jesus. Amen?